Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Danielle DiMartino Booth. She's a global thought leader on monetary policy and economics. She is the author of Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Federal Reserve is bad for America. Fed Up rose to number 22 on Amazon's bestseller list. And she founded Money Strong LLC in 2015, an economic consultancy with a great, insightful newsletter. Uh, she's also a full time columnist at Bloomberg View, a business speaker and a commentator frequently featured on CNBC, Bloomberg, Bloomberg Radio, Fox News, Fox Business News, and other major media outlets. Uh, Prior to Money Strong, she served as advisor to the Dallas Federal Reserve President Richard Fisher. Welcome, Danielle. So happy to be here. Great. I thought we'd begin with your with your book there. Um, You know, having worked for the Federal Reserve, uh, the title appears to be very strong. An insider's take on why the Federal Reserve is bad for America. Your thoughts on that? Why, Why is it bad for America? Well, listen, um, it, it's not so much that I think the Federal Reserve needs to go away. I just think that in its current form, or at least the form that it's been in since August the 11th, 1987, when Alan Greenspan took office, has ended up being very bad for our country. We have ended up on a series of booms and busts, and I, for one, am tired of being on this roller coaster and think that it is high time we reinvent the Fed take it down to the studs and build it from the ground up and make it an institution that is good for America. And you've recently uh, commented on the Federal Reserve as in terms of their biggest fear. Could you elaborate on that? Well, look, you know, we, we haven't, uh, you know, there's a, there's a fallacy here, Richard. We have not just come through an era of deleveraging. If you look back at 2007, there was $150 trillion of credit globally in the market. Today, we have over $220 trillion of debt globally in the credit markets. So what we have actually seen is a very aggressive re-leveraging, over-leveraging of the global debt markets in order to eke out the economic growth that we have seen. And I lay the blame for that at the world's central bankers printing money to kingdom come, trying to create enough debt to, to, to spur economic growth. But the question I have is at what price? And I don't think the central bankers want to answer that question. I think the $70 trillion in debt build that we've seen since the outbreak of the great financial crisis is their greatest fear. It keeps them up at night. Do you think central bankers have boxed themselves in a corner? Is there any way out? Uh, Can they actually implement quantitative tightening? Well, I think that that remains to be seen. I laugh every time I hear that that quantitative tightening, that the shrinking of the Fed's balance sheet is going to be is going to occur on autopilot. Um, they're deluding themselves if they don't think that this is a form of tightening when on day one headed into this experiment of unraveling and shrinking of the balance sheet, the Fed owns 33 percent of all mortgage backed securities in the country. They're deluding themselves. So, again, it remains to be seen if the Fed is going to remain agnostic to all data and continue shrinking the balance sheet while they increase, uh, continue to increase interest rates at the same time. It's double tightening if you think about it. And what what about other central banks? Uh, What what are your thoughts on uh, what, what they're thinking and potentially doing? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm very dear friends with, with a regular guest of yours, Peter Bookfar. And you know, he, he lays out some very simple math. If you, if you add together, if you add together what the Federal Reserve says it's going to be shrinking its balance sheet by, oh, I don't know, 400 some odd billion dollars run rate this time next year, and what Mario Draghi has committed to doing with the ECB in terms of tapering the ECB's purchases, at this time, as we're looking towards the holidays in 2018, we could theoretically have a trillion dollars less of global quantitative easing liquidity 
propping up these financial markets. It's a big number, and I think we have to take into context where that's going to put these markets from the starting point of unprecedented historic overvaluation. Is there any connection with what central banks have been doing to the rise of uh, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin? It, it is an unequivocal, staring straight in the mirror reflection of of, of investors and, 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 and citizens worldwide of their anxiety with what is being done to destroy fiat currencies because of all of this money printing going on. Bitcoin has risen up in the face of what I call a de facto but very quiet, stealthy currency war in a world where we're beginning to understand, and this is with all due deference to gold bugs, that it's not practical practical to go back on a gold standard. So we're looking for an alternative. But Richard, I have deep fears about what central banks are going to do once the cryptocurrency technology is perfected. And, and what are those fears? Well, you, you, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of FedCoin. Um, and, and FedCoin doesn't bother me to the extent of what Ken, Kenneth Rogoff has in mind for the eradication of currency and actually tracking our every move. Uh, so do you see um, sort of more pervasive uh, uh, going into by the central banks in terms of blockchain-related services? Well, I, look, it's no secret. In fact, Bill Dudley gave a speech that's on the wires uh, that he he's a complete advocate for a Federal Reserve type of cryptocurrency that ends up being a substitute, if you will, for the dollar bill in your and my wallets. And I don't necessarily have a problem with technological progress as long as that cryptocurrency, as long as the Fed coin is just as anonymous as the dollar bill is when we use it to transact physically. My greatest issue, though, is when Big Brother steps into the fray, which is why I brought up Kenneth Rogoff, because I think that he would like to see cryptocurrencies not be anonymous such that central bankers were capable, this is the scariest thought I can possibly come up with, of tracking our every single buying whim, our every purchase consideration, and knowing what we are buying on a day-to-day -day basis. These are the things that truly should keep you up at night. Mm -hmm. But would governments necessarily allow private-based cryptocurrencies to coexist with government-based cryptocurrencies? Well, well, I would have to say no. Uh, if anything, what we've seen with the parabolic thousand-point increase, and we are at a thousand points at 8.26 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on November the 29th, Bitcoin crossed the $10,000 mark, and it didn't even take it 12 hours to then cross the $11,000 mark. What we're witnessing is clearly a bubble that's going to implode on its own weight. I think we can all probably hopefully agree on that. We're all hopefully a, a, adults in the room. But I think that, that central bankers know good and well that once these cryptocurrency bubbles burst, laying in their wake will be a very refined technology that allows central bank cryptocurrencies to rise up in the to rise up where, where where they've left off, but no. To your question, what I do I think that they would be allowed to coexist? I think not. Mm. And uh, so that you you see a, a phasing out or or um, an, an abolishing of like Bitcoin and other types of private based cryptocurrencies. Well, I hate to use you know kind of inflammatory words like abolishing, but you could certainly you could certainly see a sequence of events whereby if the Bitcoin bubble ends up bleeding into other overvalued asset classes that then bleed into an economic contraction leading to recession that then end up causing the central bankers of the world, starting with the Fed, to go back to the zero bound in interest rates. Once we get to that point, and I hope we don't, I hope that our new chairman, Jay Powell, is going to, is going to say, you know what, zero interest rates didn't work. We're not going to go back there. Um, but if we get to the point where we're back at zero interest rates or worse, negative interest rates, the next logical step for central bankers is the eradication of cash 
and controlling our buying, which can only really be done electronically with this burgeoning cryptocurrency technology. So in other words, the, the central banks um, would consider pushing for cryptocurrencies, government-based cryptocurrencies, in order to implement their monetary policies. When push comes to shove, I mean, we're clearly going the opposite direction. We're anticipating a rate hike right now and further rate hikes potentially into 2018. So we're not there. But again, you could certainly lay out a sequence of events that would lead to that inevitability. I hope that's not the case. And uh, how, how do you see um, in the interim, like the, the cryptocurrencies behaving, uh, just, just rise in prices or uh, will there be a, a correction or a crash? Any ideas there? I mean, if you're, if you're asking me if I can possibly assign any kind of logic or reasoning to what we're witnessing in, in a market that's seen a 1,000 percentage point appreciation since January the 1st, 2017, you're barking up the wrong tree, Richard. I, 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 I cannot explain hmm. this price action uh, in, in my weekly newsletter that I've literally just published. Um, I, I, I included a graph of the, of the tulip mania from 1630, and Bitcoin has almost surpassed the level of that hysteria and, and, and mania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our research team has done some sort of analogous uh, valuations with gold. If, if you consider uh, the cost to mine one ounce of gold to be approximately 500 to $800 per ounce, and the current price of gold to be today around $1,200 per ounce, uh, Bitcoin is estimated to cost... Uh, approximately one thousand to one thousand two hundred dollars to mine. You know, in other words, to create one Bitcoin, so that perhaps the fair market value of Bitcoin could be something like two thousand dollars per Bitcoin. In, in analog analogy with the uh, the with the gold mining, so that would mean there would be considerable speculation uh, element right now with Bitcoin. Well, look, if you, if, if you just want to if you want to pretend that Bitcoin's not trading where it is and explore the, the economics of Bitcoin mining versus gold mining, it's, it's astronomical. I read an article that said Bitcoin mining costs what – Bitcoin mining is, is the equivalent of what 159 countries consume annually in electricity. Um, but that being said, there is something called quantum computing on the horizon. I do not pretend to understand it, but it involves quantum physics, and it will put to bed all of the – bad economics associated with mining cryptocurrencies today and make it much, much more economical. And again, I, I lay you money that the world central bankers are very much on to what is occurring at the Intels and some of the small boutique um, quantum uh, technology firms that are out there, how they're looking to displace technology as we know it today. Could, could some of the value of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies today be attributed to a uh, mobility uh, factor in terms of, uh, for example, Venezuelans or, or Chinese in China uh, using cryptocurrencies to move money out of the country? Well, I think that that has certainly been the appeal, if you will, um, of cryptocurrencies. And, and the same could go for some of the, 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 the nefarious players who have taken advantage of cryptocurrency uh, for criminal means. Um, if you don't have an alternative, sometimes you turn to the only thing that you can find. But again, the train has left the station on any logical uh, subscription of any kind to Bitcoin and these other cryptocurrencies. At current price levels, we're just talking about lunacy here, not a means – by which to, to, to get your money out of the country. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I think that that was some of the, some of the fundamental basis of Bitcoin and why it succeeded to the extent that it has and how it's been adopted the way it has. But I've heard stories that former English literature professors are leaving their, are, are leaving their, their posts at universities in order to become Bit, Bitcoin players. Wow. This is a mania. Yeah. yeah. 
That's crazy. Uh, and f- finally, um, w- what are your thoughts on Jay Powell? H- how do you see Federal Reserve policy evolving over over the coming years? Well, it, you know, it, it's it's hard to say. I mean, the, I, I'm, your crystal ball is as good as mine is in, in the near term, Richard. I, I can't say when this is going to end. I recently wrote a piece that said we could see the 3,000 on the S&P before this is all said and done. Because it long stopped feeling like 2007 and started feeling like 1998, I would say about six months ago. Wow. How, how can our listeners learn more uh, about your work, uh, Danielle? Well, I, I publish every Wednesday. Uh, they can go on my website, demartinobooth.com. That's D-I-M-A-R-T-I-N-O-B-O-O-T-H.com. Jump on a trial subscription. That gives you a 30-day look back into my archives and see if you like what I write and, and, and subscribe to my newsletter. Certainly go on Amazon and buy Fed Up if you haven't read it yet. Uh, I, I consider it to be a primer of financial literacy, and the adoption's been tremendous and humbling. And if, in the event you're bored, follow me on Twitter, at Demartino Booth. It is never, ever boring. A full-fledged debate involving Neil Kashkari, Peter Bookvar, and I broke out last weekend. Like I said, never boring. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your great insight, Danielle. Thank you. I appreciate your time. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.